for the opportunity uh, to speak here today about uh, TTIP, negotiation, uh, Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership Agreement. Uh, my name is Alex Kurzista. I'm the advisor for international affairs at the SAK Trade Union Corporation. Uh, EU share of world economic uh, EU share of the world economy has been declining, and uh, EU's relative political importance is also on the decline. And uh, I will I will argue today that uh, TTIP is a major opportunity for Europe to defend its uh, economic and political role in world affairs. Uh, I'm going to present uh, four reasons for supporting the ongoing TTIP negotiations, and uh, I want to make a clear, distinct, clear distinction between supporting the negotiations and supporting the final agreement. We, will, we don't know what the final agreement is and uh, whether we support the agreement or not uh, will depend on the actual contents of that agreement. First, TTIP is an, a major opportunity to regulate the world economy in line with the shared values and the interests of uh, the, of EU and the, the US. Uh, the WTO negotiations that, have, that uh, were opening world markets until the 1990s have been more or less dead. Instead, uh, we have negotiations on a bilateral, regional basis, and uh, we have, uh, and, uh, at, at the same time, trade policy has become part of uh, geopolitics. EU and US are, are competing with uh, countries like China and Russia on who, who, who gets to regulate the world economy, who, says, who gets to set the standards of world trade and world investments. With the EU and US market covering about half of the world economy, uh, TTIP is a major opportunity, because if we can agree on high standards for the half of the economy, and after that we can say, yes, you will, everyone else can have privileged access to this biggest market in the world, but you will have to abide by high standards of labor regulations, high standards of uh, environmental regulations, <coughs> high consumer protection standards, then you are free to come here and take use of these this, uh, economic benefits. So in TTIP we can, we can uh, give countries the incentive to uh, higher their standards. And uh, what I didn't mention, what is, what is going to be in TTIP is labor rights, environmental standards, and the high standards of uh, protection for consumers, but also fair state aid rules. Fair, fair rules on uh, state monopolies and things like this, which create major unfair, regular, unfair competitive advantages for countries like China at the moment, and which are hurting our economy and our employment. Second, uh, TTIP is a major opportunity to boost economic growth, including the incomes of workers and consumers. Dismantling tariff and non-tariff barriers will increase exports and imports, and dismantling barriers to investments will increase foreign direct investments, in other words, jobs. Growth of uh, export sectors is a main, main, main uh, benefit here for Finland, perhaps. Uh, as an example, we have our number one export in the US is at the moment cruise ships. But in the US we have uh, regulations forbidding the uh, export, import of any foreign ships other than cruise ships. So if we want to export, for example, icebreakers, that is not possible at the moment. Uh, this is uh, forbidden by an, an act called the Jones Act. Um, one of the major, major objectives of uh, Finland is to get, uh, get this act uh, removed by the US. Uh, increased imports and foreign direct investments uh, will lead to more, comp more competition. More competition uh, will, in, a, in, in the setting of fair, fair uh, rules, will lead to higher productivity. Higher productivity, of course, makes it possible for companies to lower prices for consumers, and it makes it possible for companies to pay higher wages. How, how this works in practice? Well, we have a company like BMW saying the agreement will 
decrease their costs by 500 million US dollars per year at minimum. Because uh, at the moment, BMW has to make two different parts for the, the two markets. You can't sell the same bumper to, to both markets, for example. So what TTIP will do is not just take away the tariff, tariffs, but will also create a, uh, will also make the same rules apply for the both markets. So you can sell the same bumper, same car parts to both markets, and this will lead to savings which benefit workers and consumers. Overall, we have a number of impact assessments of TTIP, and all of this, all, all the credible ones uh, clearly have a positive, uh, positive message on uh, jobs, growth, and uh, wages, and purchase, purchasing power. Of course, it's very difficult to assess uh, the impacts of, uh, of an agreement that doesn't exist. So it's difficult to say how, how big these economic benefits are. It's more easy to assess this after the agreement has been in force. Um, we can say, for example, from the calculations of the Commission that the EU-Korea agreement has increased Finnish exports to Korea by 37%. So major benefits, benefits from that agreement, for example. With increased competition, not everyone will, will benefit. This is, this is, of course, a fact. We need to anticipate the changes, in, in the structural changes that, that will take place in, in markets. And we have to help workers and entrepreneurs to, to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, so that the transition will be as easy as possible. Overall, the Commission estimates that 7 out of 1,000 employees in Europe will need to change jobs. So we are talking about a, a, a great number of people, but we need to take uh, the, the, these structural changes into account as well. Third point, uh, the risks associated with TTIP have largely been or, or exaggerated. TTIP is not about deregulation, but about maintaining high standards of, of, uh, that are in place already in the EU and in the US. Both political sides have have used a lot of political capital to, to uh, say that TTIP will not lead to deregulation. And if, if it would lead to deregulation, it would, the agreement would not, would not be ratified by the European Parliament or the Finnish Parliament or any other parliaments. So it's very unlikely that this will take place. It is also very unlikely that the privatization of public services will take place because uh, both sides in their negotiating mandates have already already said that private, uh, the public services will be protected, just like if they have been in prior agreements. Member states can, can privatize the, their uh, public services, but only if they choose to do so. And Finland is not amongst those states that uh, plan to do so. Also, the process has been, has been criticized as uh, too undemocratic. I would argue that uh, this is not, not the case. The mandate has been negotiated between member states in the EU. This mandate has been, has been decided by the governments which have been democratically elected. Also, also the final agreement will be ratified at the, or not at the, the European Parliament and national parliaments. Also, the negotiations have been more open than any other negotiations ever. In the, so, it's not, not really a good, uh, good criticism to say that there has not been openness. Fourth and final point. The potential real risks that do exist can be managed. The first real risk I would say is, uh, is that the, when, when, we are talk, uh, when we are deciding how to harmonize or in other ways put together regulations, we are also talking in, in the negotiations about setting up Permanent, uh, permanent regulatory cooperation mechanisms. And uh, there is a risk that these mechanisms will, will, be, will not be sufficiently democratic. The EU, uh, EU proposal is that NGOs, trade unions, for example, would only influence these processes once a year in a civil society forum. This is clearly, clearly not, not enough from a democratic point of view. Second, and from our point of view, the biggest risk is investment protection. But 
I would argue that the risks in this, uh, this, this uh, respect can also be managed. There is a strong consensus in, in Europe and also quite, quite strong in the US side as well that US protection will be reformed sub substantially. There have been a lot of problems with the, with the invest, invest protection agreements of the past. They have uh, allowed companies to to, uh, to sue government, sue states when they don't like the new regulations, and uh, in this way they have been able to lobby, lobby, lobby governments to pass legis legislations that are that are very favorable to them. So, but as as there is an understanding that the prior model doesn't work, th there is there is a clear consensus that reforms will be made. The first uh, priority for us in this respect would be to follow the US-Australia model in TT. In this model there would be no, no, no possibility for companies to sue, sue states. Instead, uh, investment protection, investment protection uh, disputes would be settled at the national courts and after that there would be access to state-to-state -to -state dispute settlement. If uh, this model it doesn't gain enough uh, political support, then we would we could support an ISDS mechanism, which uh, if it is reformed properly, uh, there are many 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 possibilities here. And uh, reforms in the EU Canada agreement are already going in the right direction. There is a clear reference to the right to regulate of states. There, there are legally bind, there is a possibility for, for, the, for governments to set legally binding interpretations for, for the arbitrators, arbitrators. Also, there's a code of conduct for arbitrators and there's greater transparency. On top of these changes, we would like to see, in the ideal world, a permanent multilateral investment court. This is a, a long-term goal, maybe not possible to achieve this in TTIP, but uh, this, is a, this, this, this is a major, major objective in the long run. The second point, the second uh, reform on top of CETA would be an appeal me mechanism. So if the decisions are not, not, not the right, uh, states could, uh, could appeal, appeal uh, to a permanent appeal, court, uh, appeal uh, institution. Also, we would like to see a still stronger right to regulate and we would like to see no greater rights clause. This clause would limit the, the substance of investment protection to the level of national legislations. It is very important. So, with this clause, we are giving foreign companies the same level of protection that, that uh, uh, domestic companies enjoy. This is this, this okay from our point of view. So with, the, with these changes, we can also manage the greatest risk in, uh, of TTIP investment protection. And uh, with these uh, with these uh, changes, we, we think the risks associated with TTIP are manageable, and we can take use of the opportunities of TTIP, which are clearly much greater than the risks. Thank you.